Okay, I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Gary Felton. I'm a dirty water guy. I work with the Environmental Science and Technology Department, not the Biological Resources Engineering Department. I've been talking about environment, ecosystems, and environmental stewardship for over a decade now. And things change every year, so the things that we talk about change every year. But we're going to talk a little bit. I'm kind of here for several reasons. One is, this is 15% of the exam. So I'm here to try to give you as much as I can about that. You're going to get a handout that has my presentation on it. It's a good place to take notes. Then you're going to get a second handout. Although it's 15% of the exam, I cover about 12%, not 15, because there's too much material to cover in an hour. So you're going to get something else that has notes on some things like best management practices in it. So it's not all in what I say. Some of it's what I actually sat down and wrote. What we're going to talk about starts with why. Why are we here almost? I mean, why is the focus on environmental stewardship here? Why are we doing nutrient management? And the reasons are public concern, water quality regulations. These are things that are why we're here. Best management practices come about because we want to do one of two things. We want to protect the environment. We might want to make money. Profit. Best management practices are also for profit. The public view, however, usually is guided by media reports that indicate that there is a problem. So this particular headline says, majority of area wells contaminated. Not necessarily the whole story. In that case, 9% of the wells had a chemical found, none of them above the maximum contaminant li limit. Popular press looks at course evaluations, or popular press looks at things and gives you all sorts of ideas that are a little slanted sometimes. Golf course operators overuse pesticides and fertilizers out of the Wall Street Journal. They don't have any idea what overuse means, but that was the headlines. So the popular press forms ideas that then make it to where? Our legislators. We end up with discussion in the legislature, sometimes resulting in laws. Sometimes there's images. Images like this are pretty darn tough to overcome. They are definitely images that say bright letters, something's wrong. From all that, some sort of political will gets generated. And a political will means somebody's going to do something to try to improve it. In this case, this is Bernie Fowler's sneaker index. It's not scientific, but it's a pretty good political will. It gets people's attention all the time. And if you recognize some of those people, um, I don't have a pointer handy? Go left me. OK. Dyson, Ehrlich, Fowler, and I don't know the others, but I've recognized one of those women as being part of DNR. What is the public perception, the non-point viewpoint, non-farm viewpoint, of what we do? One of the things, now this is from a lot of surveys. One of the things is the decreased nutrient loading will reduce the risk of hysteria. That's a public viewpoint. And it's still out there. Nutrient loading sources are many and varied. Well, that's true in science also. So the public has some view that there's lots of sources of nutrients. Agriculture is a major contributor. Is that true? It probably is, but it's one of many major contributors. There's pretty good evidence that agriculture is responsible for a significant amount of nitrogen and phosphorus getting in the water, and so are wastewater treatment plants, and so is urban runoff, and so is atmospheric deposition. So there's a lot of different sources of nutrients. What is one of the advantages of working with agriculture? It's the number of people. How many farms do we have in Maryland? 
12, 14,000. That's roughly the number of farms. How many homeowners? About one and a quarter million people manage their own lawns. Let's see, I can educate 14,000 or one and a quarter million. I can't do either by myself, but you all can help with some of it. Modern agriculture, this is another survey, appears to be inhumane to animals, causes or contributes to environmental risks, creates an unsafe food supply, and may be unfair to small farmers. These are public perceptions of modern agriculture. Why are these perceptions out there? Because in the industry of agriculture, we've done a pretty poor job of public relations. We don't tell anybody what we're doing. They don't have a clue how we raise things. They don't have a clue how we work. Everyone fears the unknown. So our public relations efforts need a lot of augmentation. And that's why some of these ideas are out there. Why do they appear to be inhumane to animals? Because somebody saw a video of some animal husbandry that they didn't want done to themselves. What always comes to my mind is veal calves. A lot of times veal calves are put on TV. We've brought technology to agriculture really fast. The technology that I've seen in the last 30 years has changed tremendously. Uh, we have never thought of 30 years ago about how lighting affects poultry. We never worried too much about ventilation. Now you can't build a poultry unit without a tunnel ventilation system in it. So we have changed our technology because tunnel ventilation actually helps with bacteria in the house. It reduces salmonella and E. coli in the house because of good ventilation. But that's the sort of technology we haven't told anyone else. But there's common ground out of these surveys also. There's a desire for everybody to be good stewards of resources. And I know in agriculture, Everybody, whether they're the homeowner or the operator, wants to be a good steward of those natural resources. There's a desire for farming as a way of life to exist. That means that the homeowner, the rural or the urban resident, thinks that farming should exist. Well, that's a positive view for agriculture. And there's definitely a desire for cheap, high quality food and fiber. That's from the resident, but that's also from a national security basis. We're interested in being self-sustaining and having safe food and fiber for our own country. If we look at the bay, we have a little body of water and a great big collection system. Wait a minute, come back here. If we look at this body of water, we have about 4,000 square miles of water. And that's the water section down there. We've got 64,000 square miles of water shed. What we have is this great big collector system bringing everything into one little bitty place. That's why we can have problems in the bay, because we can collect stuff from New York State. That's how far up the bay watershed goes. It goes down into most of Virginia and goes as far as West Virginia. So we're collecting water from a lot of places. It comes into the bay and it moves back and forth with the tides, but it only slowly moves out. So we have a real good place to deposit stuff. Sometimes that's not a good idea. This is a schematic of how the problems occur. Just what is the problem? And the problem is, nutrients are good things. I put nutrients in me far more often than I should, but it's a good thing. We feed our family. We feed crops. We feed animals. At that point, nutrients are a good thing and necessary. But when they get off of there and come into the water system, the aqueous system, we get problems because where did this aqueous system develop and evolve? in a completely forested environment. Before man got here to speak of, 400 years ago plus, it was all forests around here. So the algae that was in the bay had what for food? Virtually nothing. 
I mean, it didn't have much for food. What that meant was that the algae that was in the bay either died because it couldn't eat or evolved a very efficient feeding system. And the ones that evolved the efficient feeding system survived. Well, now we come along and we give them more nutrients than they're used to, and what do they do? Well, they feed efficiently. And it's a very natural occurrence. And when they feed efficiently, you get this algae bloom. They multiply in literally hours. So when nutrients come in and the conditions are right, algae multiplies and we get this huge, literally a cloud, of algae. Well, it multiplies in hours, it dies that quick too. When it dies, it kind of starts drifting down and it begins to decompose. Other than stinking, decomposition does other things too. It requires microbes. Microbes, to do this, require oxygen. And they get first claim. So the first thing they do, suck the oxygen out of the water, and that makes it difficult for other things to live. So when we get no oxygen, this dead fish is not at all accurate. What do fish do when there's no oxygen? They go somewhere else. But dead oysters can't get away. Worms can't get away. We have problems with bay grass because then we have reduced light transmission and the bay grasses decline. So that's kind of the story of how the nutrients that are the good things end up causing problems in the water. It's not the nutrients per se, it's the response of the water system that does it. And it's very real. This nice color photograph was taken on the Potomac about four years ago, and so when that algae blooms, it's real. <laughs> yeah, not where I want to go swimming, that's for sure. Um, did you notice it was the same color as the Gatorade bottle? One of the unique things about the Chesapeake Bay water system is that ratio I told you about land to water. And in this case, if you look at the bay and all these other estuaries here, we have estuaries from all over the world. The Chesapeake Bay all the way down to the Mediterranean Sea, the ratio of land area to volume of water is about 2,400, and the next biggest one is about 400. So what we have is the world's best collector system, by far, by a long shot. And that's why our system can be so sensitive to nutrients compared to other places. So that was the story of how the good stuff becomes the bad stuff. One of the questions that generally occur in many exams I haven't seen the exam, so I don't know. I'm not allowed to see them. But one of the questions that we find out after we talk to other people is, where do the nutrients come from? I've told you once, but I'm a salesman, so I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you again, then I'm going to tell you what I told you. And that'll get the idea through. So here's the one in the middle. Where does it look like they come from? In 1985, Agriculture was credited with 42%, point sources with 25%. But we also had atmospheric, forests, urban, and something called mixed open, which we won't worry about because it's small. We move over from 85 to 2000, we've gone from 42 to 38, 13, 20, 7, and 16. So we've seen a growth in the urban sector, we've seen point sources drop, and we've seen agriculture move from 42 to 38. But look at the number, and this is for nitrogen, look at the number. We've gone from 357 million pounds to 306 million pounds, so we've dropped 50 million pounds of nitrogen in that period of 15 years. The nitrogen level overall has dropped. So that's one of the questions about where do they come from. It comes from everywhere, but you can see according to the Bay program, agriculture is the largest single source. 
little more detail about well, how do things happen. And the detail is called the hydrologic cycle. Hydrologic means water, and so this is a water cycle. Cycle is around in a circle. It doesn't have a start or an end. So I'm going to pick a start and an end because I have to to talk about it. But remember, it's cyclic. It doesn't really have a beginning and an end. And the hydrologic cycle involves precipitation, ET, which Trish has talked a little bit about, evapotranspiration, infiltration. It involves surface water, and it involves groundwater. And what we've left out of that is the biologic water, the soil water that Trish has talked about. So this is a nice picture of a hydrologic cycle so I can start somewhere and end somewhere. And when we have precipitation right there, we get hit in the land. What happens? It can go one of two ways. It goes in or it goes over. Infiltration occurs. That just means water passes through the surface into the soil. When water infiltrates, it then has other choices. It can become shallow flow, also called interflow, and come right back out. If it makes it through the root zone, if it makes it past the plants that we really want to use it, it's then called percolation. And percolation is the stuff that's eventually going to make it to the groundwater. It's eventually going to get down here. And it might go this way, or it might go straight down. Groundwater also flows. It'll get a source coming in, and it'll move usually towards a stream. So that means that somewhere, when that water is coming from a stream, some of that's groundwater flow. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. A couple other things happen. When rain falls, it evaporates before it hits the ground. When rain falls, the plant can catch it, send it back up as transpiration. The plant also catches it on the surface. It's called interception. You really don't need to know much about interception. But those are some of the fates of water. We don't really get this overland flow until all the infiltration needs have been met. We don't see this surface runoff until the soil is happy with the water it has, until it has enough water. So the weather is sort of a Jekyll and Hyde. We've got to have water to grow crops. It's essential. But it's also the transport vector for the pollutants. It's how we get the nutrients that are the good things on the crop soil to become the nutrients that are not the good things when we put them in the water system. That's the transport vector. So our management needs to take care of that. We have plenty of rain in Maryland. We can have up to 45 inches a year on an average. That's in the eastern part, about uh, 35 inches in the western part. It's just not where we want it or when we want it. It's a variable. The rainfall doesn't do what we want it to do. Instead, it does what it wants to do. And this is just to give you an idea of what variable means. I'm going to go over this pretty quick. But this blue bar is the 30 or the 22-year average. This green bar is for 1988. And so if we look at this green bar in the month of May, we find out that the average is just under 4 inches. And the amount we got in that year was just about 7 inches. We got 75% more than average. Back to the green bar. In March of the same year, I got 50% less, 50% of average. Have you ever heard the term normal rainfall? There ain't no such thing. All of this is normal. This is how things occur. It's that variable. We always have that sort of variation. Look at our averages. Almost four inches, three inches, four inches, almost three and a half inches. Does it change much from month to month? We have pretty uniform rain on average. It's just that when I want it in April, or particularly in June, it might not be there. I think I'm going to skip over the. Yeah, I'm going to skip this one. This is another example of the same thing. So what does that mean? It means that if I was making washers, I would end up getting metal into my plant to make washers 
that might be that thick or it might be that thick. It might be made out of copper or it might be made out of steel. Now, how much do you think I can make in the way of washers that way? My input is not my control. Well, that's what we have in agriculture. We have an input that we don't have much control over, that being rainfall. What happens when it gets to the ground? <clears throat> Hopefully it infiltrates. That's the best fate for water is for it to infiltrate. When it gets to the soil surface, we almost never have full saturation. It's just not a very common occurrence. Most of the time, everything moves in unsaturated flow so that we always have air pockets in here. And the water that infiltrates will move in through these, and this looks like a sand. It's a very granular thing. It ignores macropores. Macropores are going to be in here in a minute. If it makes it through the soil surface, it goes into a saturated zone. But macropores have a big control, too. Trish, how much did you talk about macropores? OK, this is a picture of a macropore. See the end of the pencil? That's a hole in the ground. This is a picture of a macropore. Ever seen cracked clay like that? That's a macropore, because when the rain hits, it's going to go down those cracks long before they close back up. Macropores look something like this in the soil. There's a soil matrix made up of granular something. And soil matrix has slow flow through it. In that, you can get exchanges of chemicals between the macropore fast flow and the soil water that's in this soil matrix. So it's a place to exchange chemicals as well as to let water in. It says fast flow. So the more macropores we have, the more water I can take off of here and get into the soil somewhere. The macropores contribute to good infiltration. In fact, if we have pores and they're surface connected, a lot of water can get into the soil. If we have the same pore, but it's not surface connected, we get less water infiltrating into the soil. So the surface connection of the pores is important, as well as they're just being pores. Um, what happens when we till the land? What? It, it destroys the surface connection. It makes it more porous for, until the first rain falls over. But it destroys that surface connection. And so whenever we till, after the first rainfall, we're going to reduce the infiltration rate. That's, why we've, that's one of the reasons that no-till has been a very good management practice, because it increases infiltration. Groundwater is pretty important. So we're going to talk about groundwater and geology. Um, it's important because we use it. So as a resource, groundwater is 95% of the fresh water in the world. All that surface water we see, all the reservoirs that we've actually built, it's only 5% of the fresh water in the world. So the groundwater is a very important source of fresh water. In Maryland, about 13% of the total water used is groundwater. And that's not exact, because the way water use is reported is a little flaky from place to place. <clears throat> but it's approximately. But approximately 30% of the people in Maryland use groundwater. And the reason is that less groundwater is used in some municipal areas. If we go strictly to the rural area, strictly to places outside of town, 90% of the water use is groundwater. Only 10% is surface water. <clears throat> and this has been a very constant number over the years. It really hasn't changed much. So if you're using water outside of cities, it's probably groundwater. And so for that reason alone, you'd like to keep it kind of clean. Um, a real quick aside, who's responsible for the water quality of the groundwater if you have a well? You are. 
you and nobody else. The state has no responsibility. Cities have no responsibility. County has no responsibility. You're responsible for your own groundwater. So you want to do everything you can, and you want everyone else to do everything they can to keep it clean. <clears throat> if you see a city like Salisbury, what are they on? Surface water or groundwater? They're on groundwater. They have a well field, and they pull out groundwater, and then they distribute it through the city. Do you think the people in Salisbury that turn on their tap have any clue about that? They don't. <clears throat> so where does groundwater occur? And this is a great set of questions here. So think of each statement here as a question. It occurs in geologic formations called aquifers. Probably one answer. We have several types of aquifers. I'm going to say this twice. We have granular, we have solid but cracked, and we have solid with solution channels. Uh, yeah. We have some regions. If you look at this up here, this is the figure and the page out of the book that you have. And is that book on CD right now? You've got it on CD. But the page number is still there. So this tells you where this is coming. And this is a reference to go back and check on before you take an exam. We have these regions in our watershed area. Now, we're looking at Maryland. And so Maryland has this nice Atlantic coastal plain region. What does this look like right here besides a dividing line for coastal plain regions? Also looks like I-95. So if you need a reference for where the coastal plain is, it's roughly at I-95. Then we have something called the Piedmont. And that covers a pretty fair portion of Maryland. See this little thing called the Blue Ridge? Well, we have a nice factor with the Blue Ridge that we have a special set of aquifers there. And we have solid aquifers with solution channels. Another word for that is karst, K-A-R-S-T. I don't know why it's emphasized so heavily in the exam, but I see statements about karst. And karst is basically holes in limestone. In fact, limestone will dissolve in water. When we get rainfall, Rainfall runs through organic matter. The result of that is that we get carbonic acid in the water. It's very weak acid, but it, it's enough that the limestone will dissolve. And when you get dissolved limestone, what do you get? Hmm? Well, you get hard water for the water, but you also get something happens to the limestone. You get sinkholes, caves. That's the characteristics of karst, sinkholes and caves. If you live anywhere in Frederick County, you know that Walkersville water supply is karst. Some of Frederick County kind of runs from northeast to southwest all the way down the Potomac River. There's lots of sinkholes, limestone outcrops. That's a karst area. After that, we get the ridge and valley section, and then we get some of the Appalachian Plateau. Those are the areas that we think about, and there's five of them in Maryland. And I say five because I'm almost sure there's a question that says, what are the five areas? I like this picture better because it's uh, more easily identifiable. I can identify with colors better. Um, but I'm also running out of time. So we have all of these regions in Maryland. And this is the other one I wanted to get to. These are different versions of the same aquifer picture. This is the interparticle porosity. It's typical of the coastal plains. This is fracture porosity. It's both Ridge and Valley and the Piedmont. You get water from cracks in the rock. Because the rock moved and folded and bent, it created cracks in it. That's where the water is when you drill a well. That's why in South Carroll County, we can get five gallons a minute at most. And on the eastern shore, I can get 1,200 gallons a minute out of the sandy type soil. This is the karst so soil. It's got cracks in it, but those cracks get enlarged by water dissolving the limestone. This is another 
picture very similar to the one that Trish had. One of the points on this one is that the water resides in sandy sediments and gravelly sands on the eastern shore. And it's divided by layers of less pervious, a pretty tight stuff, either clay or silt or clayey silt. There may be another layer of sand and another layer of sandy clay and silt. So if this is a tight layer and this is a tight layer, I've got a sand in the middle. That sand is confined. That makes this a confined aquifer. This one is a sandy sediment, and it's not confined. And it has a water table right there. And look, it runs down to a stream. So the water will move into the soil and right into a stream in the unconfined aquifer. And we have unconfined aquifers all over the shore. If you do anything that has to do with water quality, sooner or later you'll run into nitrogen contents in the unconfined aquifers. And that's where our nitrogen contents are high on the eastern shore. You almost can't drill a well without the nitrate being higher than 10 milligrams per liter on the shore. So when you drill a well, I'm aiming for this one. Underground, 30% of the annual precipitation gets to the water table aquifer. That was the first aquifer. But only one inch reaches the confined aquifer on an annual basis, meaning that very little of what falls as rain makes it down into the water supply. Most of our water supplies are deeper. Very few wells right now are in the unconfined aquifer. If you look at this, this might be a good picture of southern Maryland, where we have an unsaturated zone, but the saturated zone is very close to the surface. This could also be Somerset County. And we have that moving into surface water. So the trip from the surface to the water table is not very far, and it moves into surface water pretty readily. There is an intimate connection between the two. Groundwater returns to the surface is something we call base flow. Now this is the part I wanted to come back to. When we look at a stream, how much water do you think is groundwater? 25, 50, 75%? I don't know is an answer that's OK today. Let's think about drought. When's the last time we had a good drought, if there is such a thing? Two years ago? OK, 2008. Roughly how long did we go without water? OK, we went for a full growing season, right? All that 12 weeks? Potomac River went dry, didn't it? What was flowing over Great Falls? Groundwater. That was all groundwater coming out. So when you see a drought and you see the water still flowing, that's all from a groundwater source. That's the water coming out of those shallow aquifers into the surface water all along the stream. But when I say it travels along fractures between sand grains and in solution channels, that's how much is traveling. Right there below Great Falls, the minimum volume allowed, if you can control nature, is 100,000 gallons a minute. So that's an idea of what's flowing through the Potomac at Great Falls. Typically, groundwater moves at speeds of feet per day or even inches per day. It's really, really slow. So once it gets in an aquifer, groundwater can stay there literally for centuries. If I put a float in at Harve de Grace in the Chesapeake Bay, and that float, I was able to track it. By the time it got to the ocean, it could be about 21 days. So we can move that 200 mile length of the bay in 21 days. But I can move 200 inches, I don't know, maybe two years in ground. So the speeds are so drastically different that they have an impact on things.
Now, when we look at erosion, you can see that. You can clearly see erosion. That's the visible pollution. And if you look at this fellow's foot, he's in a little tiny gully that was formed by one storm, just one rainfall event. Now, this was a research plot designed to do this. So that's what happens when you farm up and down the hill with, not, with um, just conventional till plowing up and down a pretty good steep hill. And that's the kind of thing you get. Nutrient movement's out of sight. You don't see that. This is a picture of annual fertilizer use about nutrients. This is how we've used fertilizer since 1945. And instead of asking you, 1945 was when the war was over. In the war, we learned how to take nitrogen. Actually, we learned about World War I, but it wasn't really let out until World War II was over. We learned how to take nitrogen out of the air and turn it into nitrate. Because why? It's important in gunpowder. And so that's where fertilizer came about, from the commercialization of gunpowder. I wish that was a question, but it won't be. But as you can see, we have a trend. Did I put trend line? No, I didn't. We have a trend, and our fertilizer use went pretty high. Then it kind of leveled out. And we kind of, I'm not sure if we have two different trends here or just one across the whole thing. But we have shifted our trend somewhere around 1978, roughly. So we've changed our fertilizer use habits somewhere around 78. And we started becoming aware of impacts of things we do on the land in general around 1970. So we can see where we've begun to change our practices. I'm going to show you something that you don't really need to pay attention to except to say that some of the fertilizer sales data may be a little bit odd. Um, it looks like it's increasing, but we found something interesting out a couple of weeks ago. And that's if it's reported as pounds of fertilizer, that also includes all of the potting soil that's sold, all of the um, soil amendments that are sold. That's called fertilizer because the fertilizer law in Maryland is one purpose, and that's to collect taxes. So some of the reporting that we get is not quite what we want to see. So if you see fertilizer sales data in Maryland, take it with a grain of salt. The interaction between man and nature is chemical transport. And so <clears throat> we have conventional till, no-till, no-till wheat, conventional till, and conventional till wheat stub. And if we look at runoff, and we look at October 87 on a particular farm, 41% of the runoff comes from conventional till. But let's look at no-till soybeans. That's the red one. That's only 15%. So the difference between conventional till and no-till is pretty significant. We go from 41% to 15%. We've reduced the amount of runoff by going to conventional till. If we look at wheat, we see pink in this dark color. Here's pink conventional till. And this dark color, we go from 26 to 12%. So going from conventional till to no-till reduces the amount of runoff pretty significantly. It's a good practice for um, controlling water. Now how about nitrogen? I'm going to say this carefully. Because you've got to take this with a grain of salt. This is runoff. Doesn't say anything about infiltration. In conventional till, 68% of the nitrogen comes. Compare that to 8% in no-till. So obviously, you can reduce the amount of nitrogen by going from conventional till to no-till. But that doesn't make much difference because the amount of nitrogen that leaves in surface runoff is really, really low. Most nitrogen leaves through infiltration. Phosphorus leaves through surface runoff. Nitrogen infiltration. That's probably a question. What is the major route for nitrogen and phosphorus transport? And I'm going to show another picture of that in a minute, maybe three minutes. If we look at changes in concentration of nitrate with land use and position, this is from the USGS. And this is something that they 
brought as a generalized aquifer. It doesn't represent anything specific except that it represents the eastern shore. Uh, this is Judy Devers that did it. If you look, we get a little bit of nitrate down to nothing. If you look here, we get a lot of nitrate down to nothing. A lot of nitrate down to nothing. Over here, we get a little less nitrate. Two of the things we see is that nitrate is moving towards the surface water. <clears throat> the other thing is that deep water doesn't have any nitrate. Why doesn't deep water have any nitrate in it? It's all in the same aquifer. If this is 40 to 100 feet deep down here, how long does it take water to move through soil or through sand or through underground? Inches per year? How many years does it take to move 100 feet if it's moving a quarter of a foot a year? That might be 100 times 4, right? This water here might be 400 years old. So of course down that deep there's no nitrogen because 400 years ago there was no nitrogen applied, was there? So that's one of the reasons that our water down here has lower nitrogen. It's just so old that no water that hit the surface while we've been here has made it there yet. So. Here's the generalized picture of where chemicals go. If you get precipitation and you get runoff, then you get phosphorus off the surface. You can get nitrogen going through. That's the generalized fate of our two primary nutrients that we worry about. I can make exceptions for all of this, but this is the general idea. When do chemicals move? We just told you a little bit about where they move. Now when do they move? We look at this precipitation and we have average precipitation all the time. But we look at nutrient movement. This is a window and I'm going to call this window winter. It's about the first day of December to roughly the first day of April. You can see where January 1 falls in here. And this is water, or this is actually cumulative nitrate, coming out of a very large spring in a karst area. It collects water from 4,700 acres. It's a big chunk of land. It's a general watershed because it's got agriculture in it, urban in it, open lands in it, hunting lands in it, a little bit of everything. But we find that we get this big surge of nitrogen during the winter. When do you all apply nitrogen? After March 1st. Very good. That would be what? Right about here? Just as it's starting to flatten out? So why is it that we see the nitrogen leaving in winter? And the reason is the biological water that Trish talked about. I hope I got there. Yeah, that's the slide I was looking for. So let's start with January. If you walk out somewhere in January, what's the soil like beneath you? Is it dry, wet, intermediate? What is it? Usually in January, it's pretty wet. It's been raining for a while. And how much plant activity do we have? Zero. Nothing. So any rain that comes down doesn't get sent back up. So that means that we've got so soil full of water. <clears throat> this is a water surplus, in fact. That's what this whole bar is in here, a surplus of water. It's water we're not going to use. So every time it rains onto the surface, something's got to go somewhere. And that's why we see things in the winter the water's got to go somewhere. That's when it can take nitrogen with it, because it's got to go somewhere. Over here, when we start growing, we start taking this soil moisture and using it. This is the water the plant would like to use. It can't get to it because it's not there anymore. 
And so we end up over here in September. Here's where that really dry soil comes in. Uh, we have used all the water that we could faster than it comes down. So what I've got is soil pores that have what in them? Air, lots of air, OK? Is there any water? Yeah, but it's that 8 or 10 milligrams that we saw in that previous chart. So the first thing that happens when it rains, and you know we always talk about fall rains, those soil pores have to fill up with water. Then somewhere around the first day of December, they're full. Rain keeps coming, because you know we had uniform rain, roughly. And it starts pushing water through. Remember the interchange we saw in the macro pores? That water is now pushing through and taking chemicals with it. So that's why we see this stuff coming off in the winter rather than in the summer. In fact, our lowest our nutrient content of streams might be the last day of August. You might see half a milligram per liter in a creek, whereas you would normally see three milligrams per liter in a creek. The point is that groundwater and surface water are directly linked to each other. That was a karst system, but we found the same thing in other studies that other people have done in just about every system. We get droughts. We get no rain, but streams flow. I'm sort of doing a summary here. We get floods, high rivers. Well, the water goes back into the aquifers beside it from flood situations. That means the water that has chemicals in it is going back into the groundwater system beside it, into the shallow groundwater system. It's intimately connected. It goes back and forth. <clears throat> and if water can, so can pollution. Conditions that lead to surface runoff. What leads to surface runoff might be a good question. You might see it again. Heavy soils, what's a heavy soil? Clay. What's a silty clay loam? Is that a heavy soil or a light soil? It, it's a leads to heavy, it's a leads to runoff soil. How's that? Okay. It's capable of generating runoff. Steep slopes generate runoff. Disturbed soils generate runoff. And poor plant cover. What's in the box? Those are things we can control. The other two, the heavy soils and the steep slopes, I can't control those, certainly not very easily. But the disturbed soils and the poor plant cover, those I can control. And that's what we make best management practices out of, the things that we can control. We can do tillage differently. We can do conservation tillage. We can do residue management. These are all management practices. We can do cover crops. Cover crops give us better plant cover. What about conditions that lead to leaching? This might look like the other, like the slide previous. You'll probably expect the same thing. Light soils, sandy for instance. Um, What's our sassafras soil, typically? It's the biggest soil on the shore, I believe, the most air, highest aerial extent. What would we call that? How about a sandy loam? That's a light soil. It's got flat slopes. That's another thing that leads to infiltration. High residue, heavy plant cover, these are things, again, that we can manage. We have tillage to handle that. We have conservation tillage to handle that. Residue management, cover crops, that all looks the same, doesn't it? The same things are our management techniques to control runoff and to manage infiltration. If we look at the generalized fate of nitrogen, we're not going to talk about this one a whole lot, but this one's getting more and more attention. Volatilization and denitrification, we don't think about as much, maybe as we should, but I certainly don't think about it as much as I do about crop uptake, erosion, runoff, and leaching. So if we're looking at the fate of nitrogen, 
we see in case A sort of three prongs. If we come over here to case B, we see a great big leaching, little erosion, little runoff, crop uptake, and volatilization. Notice the crop uptake don't change. So those are the two different conditions we can have. I guess the next picture will have the page number. This is directly out of your CD. I'm going to have a hard time with that. And these are different conditions you can make based on management practices. So there's a trade-off between surface nitrogen loss and leaching loss. Here we have erosion and runoff large. Here we have erosion and runoff small. Leaching small, leaching large. Those are leaching potentials. They may or may not occur. They are a potential. And so you get a trade-off. There's no silver bullet. It's not, here, I can do something that will cure all problems. It's a trade-off. And that's if runoff control is practiced. Theta phosphorus, same two pictures. We have large runoff, large erosion, small runoff, small erosion. But look at leaching. Doesn't matter much, does it? So there is no trade-off between surface phosphorus loss and phosphorus leaching. There is with nitrogen. There isn't with phosphorus. Whether you control the runoff or not, you don't affect leaching of phosphorus to speak of. We, again, we can make exceptions for this. We think about a farm basis on something called a nutrient balance. And on that balance, we look at like a checkbook. What comes in, what goes out. And so on the crop farm, we get fertilizer in, we get crop field, crops out, and we get some losses. So that's a nutrient balance. If we look at numbers, that might be 36 pounds of fertilizer per acre per year in, 32 out in crops. So that gives us a loss of four in the bright red letter. Now if we go to livestock farms, I put some of those numbers in, we'll get 22 pounds of phosphorus per acre per year in as fertilizer. We'll get 60 more pounds in per acre per year as feed. So we have roughly triple the amount of phosphorus in as feed. We'll send some milk out in this case, 24 pounds of phosphorus per acre per year, and we'll end up with some losses. The losses are 58 pounds per acre per year. So in animal agriculture, we have the potential for a whole lot more losses. One of the reasons is we've got two processes going on there. One is the crop field, and the other is the animal. So first off, everything that we do that involves biological creatures leaks. If it's a crop field, it leaks. If it's an animal, it leaks. We don't have 100% efficient anything. I wish we did. We'd have a lot less work to do. But because we have two systems, we have losses from both systems. The animal system seems to have a lot of losses. And I think I have another, yeah. And here's why the animal system has a lot of losses. What we do with nutrient flow in the industry, now I've left the farm. I'm now looking at either the state of Maryland or the Chesapeake Bay. And that's my boundary instead of a farm for a boundary. So I'm looking at a great big boundary. And what we get is we get crops built in the Midwest. That becomes feed. It moves over to our area. Animals use it. Produce goes out. <clears throat> and animal manure goes where? It stays in Maryland, doesn't it? There's something missing. We don't have the manure nutrients going back to make a cycle of it. Instead, think of it this way. We're a dumping ground for the nutrients that come from the Midwest. We don't have a system to get those off the watershed. We just keep bringing them in. 
I'd like to use them better, and we can, but we have this basic nutrient imbalance in the greater system. Okay, let's bring it, make, make it personal now. How do you guys do something? <clears throat> Standard nitrogen management techniques, and you're going to hear about management techniques for, what, the next day and a half? So I'm just barely touching on them. Proper application rates need realistic yield goals, need soil and manure testing. You account for all nutrient sources, everything. You need to put it in the right place. You need to put it in the right place at the right time. These are management techniques that need to be practiced. And nutrient management planning looks at assessment of a system. You do an analysis. There's decision making, evaluation, refinement, but it's a cycle. Just because you've gotten to the end, it's not over. It's going to happen some more. Things are going to change and you're going to continuously work on this as a cycle. If you want a more specific picture out of your textbook, here's the citation, figure 1.7, page 12. And it's a cycle where there's planning, record keeping, assessment, management options, and start over again with more planning. So this is the nutrient management technique that's going to help manage those nutrients that we get from Iowa. The other thing we want to do is profit. I think we still want to have profit in farming. Um, it's going to tend to keep us in farms. Two things make profit. The returns, the money you get in from the crop, and the costs, what, it, what you put into it. So we want to increase the returns We'd like to increase the returns and decrease the cost. Either one will improve the profits. One of the things we need to think about is what we put on the land. This is going to be something called diminishing returns, which is probably a question on the exam. So we might want to think about this. Let's look at what happens here when I put 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre onto a corn crop. And my yield goes from somewhere just above 50 to somewhere just below 70. So what would be my yield on that? 70, 50, that'd be, call it 16, maybe it's 17 bushels per acre. That's pretty low yield, right? But that 17 bushels is what I got from 40 pounds of nitrogen. It's a 16% yield increase. Now let's move over. I'm going to add 40 more pounds of nitrogen. I'm going to get a 2.5% yield increase. So when I put on 40 pounds of nitrogen here, my return, think of this as return, is 16%. Same 40 pounds here, I get a 2.5% yield increase. That's called diminishing returns. You can keep adding until you start losing money. How come I lose money? Well, you've got to pay for that 40 pounds of nitrogen. Well, nitrogen's pretty cheap. But you also have to pay for fertilizer, fuel, time, harvest, harvest that's lost, lost crep revenue, and all the other things that go into a farming operation. As you increase that yield, you have to pay for all the operations around it. So you get this diminishing return even though the yield is going up. So somewhere along the line you've got to change and say, I've got to quit working for yield and I've got to start working for something else. Let's see if this works. How about that? Okay. How about some questions? We have one whole minute, maybe two. Comments are good too. If you have something else to say, say it. You don't have to agree with me. You're just tired, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. Oh, turn the switch at the bottom. Um, back to your handout um, where you had the two conditions for surface run runoff and conditions that lead to leaching. Yes. If, you, if I read it, 
in reference to my farming operation. I also am reading if high residue leads to conditions that encourage leaching. No, no, then no. High residue might yield potential for leaching. It won't necessarily yield leaching. It just leads, yields a potential. But yes. Right. So how does conservation, how does no-till encourage? I mean, that, to me, that then says no-till actually encourages leaching. Even though we're trying to build our no-till no encourages organic matter. infiltration. It does encourage infiltration. If you've got chemical around, it'll encourage leaching. And in fact, in Oklahoma, where they have a water problem, they found that on their no-till crops, the nitrogen content is higher below the no-till than it is below the con um, conventional tillage. So it does encourage leaching. Yes. If you want to look at it. So we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. You're almost correct. Okay. But what happens when you what happens when you leach nitrogen rather than run it off? It gets far more opportunities to be treated biologically. So given the two choices, I'd always rather to see it infiltrate. It has far more management capability there than if it runs off. Because if it runs off, it's in the creek. <laughs> So yes, damned if you do, damned if you don't, that's part of it. It's one of our uncontrolled um, inputs that we don't get to fool with as much as we'd like to. That's a very good observation. I don't think I can print that, can I? <laughs> Wouldn't do that? Okay. Yeah, between a rock and a hard spot's better. Okay. Anything else? Great.